Hello, hello, and welcome back to What is a Biology? I'm your host as always, Mr. Johnny Hopkins, and today we're going to be covering transcription factors, riboswitches, and some stuff about polymerase termination and elongation. Nah, it's not that important for all what we really care about, proteins. So, what we really care about are proteins, and that's transcription factors. Those are proteins, actually, believe it or not. And so they can be actually controlled by these things called external signals. And um, so these external extracellular signals um, can be in the form of hormones, such as growth factors. And some of them can be actually lipid soluble and steep on through the um, extracellular matrix and through the plasma membrane and into the cell. So now that these guys are inside the cell, they will then attach to these transcription factors that are freely floating within the cytosol. And within the cytosol, these guys will, uh, will attach to the nucleotide receptors. And typically, transcription factors of this kind have three different domains. They have an N-terminal uh, variable linker activating domain, the N-terminal uh, activating domain, which can range from either 100 to 500 amino acids long. You have the DNA binding domain, which uh, usually binds through a zinc finger, and that's how actually you get these uh, specificity. Um, usually can only bind around six base pairs on the DNA. However, the specificity can be reached by dimerization typically, and as well as spacing through these dimerizations. So you get six here, six there, and a little bit here and there. So that means you actually are able to get a very specific sequence, even though it's only six by itself. And then there's the final third domain, which is the C-terminal hormone binding domain. So once the activation happens, once you uh, bind the hormone, then it gets registered up in the alster with the N-terminal region, you get the activating uh, through ligand and binding. And so then one thing that can actually happen is you can deacetylate histones in, once you're inside the nucleus, which then will cause activation. It will re reverse re repression, causing activation. So like, uh, as I said, this can be happening with different growth factors, GFs. Um, and so you get to, you get, which mediates the nucleic transport. And uh, some instances when you don't have a hormone, typically it's cytoplasmic and bound to uh, different inhibitors such as HSP90, a heat shock protein. And when you have a hormone bound, it will release the inhibitors by just kind of breaking off apart and doing its own little weird allosteric thing. Goes on in, um, into just the nucleus and finds the response element and causes the activation of said gene. So now we're gonna change uh, directions a little bit and just talk about how the termination of polymerases occurs, which we have uh, polymerase one, two, and three. Now, real quick refresher, polymerase one, it is a, it is specific, polymerase one primarily does rRNA, polymerase three primarily does tRNA as well as the 5S rRNA, and two makes proteins, the things that we care about, the wiggly boys that fold into complex structures. So polymerase one, the rRNA guy, uh, uses a specific termination factor that it binds in a very specific orientation and causes the termination itself. Uh, it usually binds, I believe, around 13 base pairs. Then you have uh, polymerase three, which uh, terminates at a poly U site. And then uh, number two, um, polymerase 2 can actually bind, can terminate either usually typically two ways by a rival switch at about 50 base pairs, which will be uh, explained in a hot second. And then it can also, it's usually typically done um, about a half to two kilobases downstream of the poly A um, site. So now we're going to talk about HIV transcription which is a very specific instance of a rival switch, but it's also a very special instance of a rival switch. So what happens is you've got a viral gene locus tip, uh, with the HIV, produces multiple of the viral ge um, genomes, and then it'll hybridize with construction fragments in the promoter proximal region of the DNA, and causing more and more genes, and causing the uh, immune system to fail, and the uh, patients to be deeply affected. So, continuing on, the way that uh, the RNA looks as it comes out of uh, Paul 2, it looks a little bit like this. So you got these two little hairpins, and these two hairpins combine two different proteins, cyclin T and TAT, or TAT. 
We're going to call it TAT, even though I think most people say TAT, uh, THC. So TAT is an anti-termination factor, and this is a ribose switch. So once TAT binds to here, it will continue on going through, and it binds at this RNA, um, binds at a specific place of the TAR um, sequence. And this TAR hairpin has the two binding sites for TAT and site T, which actually bind cooperatively. So what does cooperativity mean? It means that once TAT binds, cyclin T is more likely to bind, and if cyclin T binds, then TAT is more likely to bind. So it's more it's a lot harder to find just one bound than both bound because of the energetic favorability of these processes together. So if you if these guys bind, then it'll just keep on going through and it'll terminate uh, at that two kilobases past the poly A tail past the poly A uh, location. However, if there is no binding that occurs, then you have premature termination and the uh, mRNA sequence is not actually completed. So on a completely different note, in a completely different world, we have heat shock genes. And so these are completely different in that, um, so what happens is, is you have RNAP just join on to a uh, piece of DNA. And so this polymerase, PALP2, is on the DNA and it makes about 25 nucleotides. And then it just pauses and stops it, but it doesn't terminate. It's just kind of sitting there doing whatever the heck it wants. And just kind of chilling, having a good time with this wiggly boy out of its exterior doing its own thing as well. The wiggly boy in this case is an RNA uh, transcript. So, and then, once there's heat, there's this heat shock, this stress produced on the environment. You have HSTF activate, and then it will bind the promoter, pro promoter proximal region, and it will then reinitialize polymerase 2, and it will create these genes that help associate, that help uh, deal with when you're in heat shock and you have to combat this horrible stress of environments. So that's how uh, we can respond to stresses very quickly as uh, cellular beings. Now, finally, we're going to talk about uh, the initiation of some of the weird boys, if you will. So we primarily only care about Paul 2 because it makes proteins, even though it's like only 5% of the nascent transcripts inside our cells. And the Paul 1 and Paul 3 are the most um, are more used than Paul 2. So uh, so the DNA that it binds to, you have the core elements at uh, Paul 1 where it binds at negative 40 to plus 5 base pairs and an upstream elements of around 150 to uh, minus 60, um, that's the upstream element and that actually stimulates the folding tenfold so get rid of, um, get rid of that, that little sequence right there and then the, there's going to be 10%, there's going to be only 10% of the approximate nascent transcripts being made of this rRNA. So the assembly happens by uh, binding an upstream activating factor, or a UAF, if you're in that fancy world of dealing with upstream and activating factors. And two uh, six of the upstream activating factor are subunits, two of the six subunits are histones. And so what happens is that the core, um, the core factor is bound by Paul 2 with TDP, which is stands for Tata binding protein, but it does not actually bind a Tata here because it is not a transcribed gene for Paul 2. But so TDP is just a generic, is just a uh, binding DNA protein, um, just binds the DNA at the specific point, and then it will. Um, Common complex with the Paul 1, and it will just begin its initiation and activation of said transcript. Now you have Paul 3, and Paul 3, um, the transcripts that it actually does are very interesting in that the promoter is inside the transcribed sequence. So the promoter is part of the sequence itself. It's not this uh, separate being like it is in Paul 1 and Paul 3. And so um, and so these internal promoters are known as the A box and the B box that are in all tRNA. However, the 5S RNA actually has its own internal control region, the C box. Very, very um, unique and interesting names here, uh, A, B, and C. So you have uh, three transcription factors that are very useful and interesting. You have TF3C, TF3B, 
that will initiate uh, both tRNA and the 5S rRNA, and but you've also got TF2, TF3A that only works on the 5S rRNA. And finally, you've got TF3B, uh, which is actually a lot like TF2B, which is in Paul 2 and it will actually uh, bind the sequence and direct the polymerase to the start site. And finally, we have the weird DNA guys that we just haven't talked about. The ones that are caused by old, good old um, evolution and the eating of old bacteria and a symbiotic relationship. The mitochondria and the chloroplast. So mitochondrial DNA is mtDNA. It has a uh, nuclear, the polymerases are, nu um, are bound in the nucleus, RNAP. So we have to actually import those RNA uh, polymerases so that the uh, mitochondria can actually do its own polymerization and create its own proteins and such. And so you've got this uh, transcription factor, TFAM, that will bind the uh, mitochondrial DNA at the promoter and then initiate uh, uh, RNAP uh, polymerization. And then you've got chloroplast DNA, which chloroplast DNA has, um, it's got two polymerases, one that evolved from bacteria, that is quite similar to bacteria, one that is quite similar to bacteriophage or mitochondria. And so RNAP2 in the actual nucleus itself will actually indirectly, because um, it encodes the RNAPs here, it will actually um, vicariously control the chloroplast gene expression because it has to control this RNAP uh, production and then import. Um, and furthermore, you've got the control region in the chloroplast DNA, which is about minus 35 to minus 10 base pairs from the uh, start site. So that's that's about everything here. So to wrap up real quick, transcription factors can be controlled by hormones, and they can do um, allosteric afterwards to you know go ahead and release the inhibitors and cycle on into the nucleus. You've got these things called ribose switches that control the expression of uh, gene of RNAP2 uh, transcripts. And you have heat shock genes, which RNAP is always bound to it, and then once it undergoes stress, those guys go and run forward and make a, some good old nascent uh, mRNA transcripts. Then we've got polymerase 1 and 3 that have some fancy little unique stuff that bind the initiations, as well as some fancy stuff with mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA that are unique because you have to import these RNA polymerases. So that is it for transcription factors. We'll be uh, talking about more different gene regulation techniques that are not done at the uh, transcription factor level, but rather post-transcription. So I will, I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.